All right, so we're back. We're doing the last of our uh, goodness of fit hypothesis tests now. It's been a goodness of fit day for me. Hopefully uh, you guys are getting good at this stuff at this point. And uh, you recommend doing some practice problems in between, of course, to try to lock it in. Um, but what we're going to do next is a particular type of distributional test. We're doing goodness of fit, and we're doing a test of normality. And you're going to see that we're going to use a kind of a trick to turn a normally distributed variable into kind of a into a kind of a multinomial variable. Um, this might be a long one. I think I just am allowed to post things longer than 15 minutes on YouTube now, so I might, I might be taking advantage of that. But normality takes a little while. Why would you want to use this? Well, it turns out that if you want to do an F test uh, for two sample variances, you need to assume that the populations are normally distributed. Um, there are other cases. When you know something's normal, it's handy. You can do lots of stuff with it. Okay, so I'm going to use the example uh, from a textbook that uses this data. I'm going to copy and paste it into this document so you guys can see. It uses this data for job applicant test scores. Uh, let's pop it right here. So it has a bunch of data. Um, you don't need to copy that down. Um, maybe you do. <laughs> You'll see me work with it. You can do it in your own time if you want. Um, and as always, uh, for nor for goodness of fit tests, we have two. Well, we have these hypotheses. Um, the population matches, right? In this case, the population is normally distributed. And in this case, uh, it's going to be with a mean of x bar, and you want to calculate what that is, and a standard deviation of s, whatever that is. And we're going to test that against the alternative that uh, this does not appear. This is not normally distributed with that, with those values. So what we're going to do is we're basically going to assume that this comes from a normal distribution with these param with these uh, with the mean of whatever x bar is in the state. Yeah. We're going to assume that this is uh, normally distributed, that this is the distribution it comes from, and if if it doesn't, if it looks weird, then we're going to figure out, we're going to decide that it's not normally distributed with these parameters. And when I say a mean of x bar, what I mean is a mean of mu equals x bar and a standard deviation of sigma equals s, because those are our point estimates. Remember, those are our best guess. Okay, so what do we do? Well, first we take our random sample. We need to do this to, to state our hypotheses, really, because we don't want to just leave it as x bar. We take our random sample, we pop them into uh, Excel, if we can. Uh, do I have an Excel open? This is from the last one I did. Yes, we do. We have a whole bunch of stuff here. Okay, so I copied and pasted those numbers. We can use the average formula to find this. And that'll give us a, a mean of 68.42. Um, and we can also use we can also use the st dev formula. We could do this by hand if we wanted to. It takes a long time, so we're not going to worry about it. It's going to be 10.41 is going to be our standard deviation. Excel makes this go much faster. So now let me move these over quick, and I'll have, write x bar equals that's not x x bar equals s equals. Now I can just copy these back into my board so you guys can see them. Where do we want to put this? All uh, right, here's good. So now our new null. Sorry, that was a little loud. I apologize. Our new null is this. H0 is that x is distributed normally with a mean of 68.42 and a variance of 10.41 squared. Um, and our alternative is that x is not normally distributed with those things, etc. Okay. So, what do we do? Well, we need to do we need to do a goodness of fit test. Which, if you've noticed, we need to generate categories. Is the way that this works. So our chi squared test is going to look just like it has before. Um, I'll write out the formula and then I'll show you how we get the data for it. Our test statistic is going to be chi squared equals the sum over i cat over k categories from i equals one to k of uh, f i the observed frequency for category i minus the expected frequency for category i all over the 
expect squared and then divided by the expected frequency. Under the null, it's actually going to be distributed k minus 3 this time. That's because uh, we, are, we had to calculate x bar and s first. And so we burned two other degrees of freedom. We'll talk more about degrees of freedom when we get to regression. But for now, that's what you can... Uh, you can just you can just stick with that. So, what's the deal? Well, we need to know what a few of these things are. K are categories. Fi is the observed frequency. Ei is the expected frequency. We've used these before, except for now we don't have obvious categories, right? Oh, we need to know our sample size. We didn't count. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we have fifty. 50. Hmm. Is that right? 550. Okay, that's yes, we do. Okay, so in order to do a goodness of fit test, we need to get categories. To do this, what we do is we create a bunch of intervals. Sometimes we call these bins. I like to call these bins because um, that's what we use for histograms. Um, so we're going to create bins and we need to know how many bins to create. These are our categories. Well, for our goodness of fit test to work, the expected frequency has to be greater than or equal to 5 for all. That little upside down A means for all. For all categories. So, to make sure that this works, what we do first to figure out is we take uh, our sample size divided by 5. Okay, then we round down. So, with a sample set, if n equaled 100, then k would equal 100 divided by 5 equals 20. If n equaled 72, then k would equal 72 divided by 5 equals 14.4. So we'd have 14 bins. As it stands, we have n equals 50, so we're going to have 10 bins. That's how it's going to work. The reason is that if we define the right number of bins, then we, we can guarantee that we'll have at least five in each one, right? Because here, if we had 20 bins, as long as we define them correctly, they'll each have five. Here, if we have 14 bins, that's a B-I-N-S, by the way, um, then they're each going to have at least five. They're actually going to have a little bit more than five on, on expectation. But we want to have at least five in order for this. The reason we do this is that if we don't, then the chi-square distribution thing, this breaks down. The, the, under the null, distribu the null distribution breaks down. So we need E-I to be five in every case. Okay, so we need to create k different categories. That that is going to be n, uh, n over five different categories. And what we want them to do is we want them to be equally sized bins. Okay, now how do bins work for distributions? Well, or how does size work for distributions? So we want equally sized bins, and for size, by size we mean probability. So how big is it going to be? Well, if we had, tw what we want is each each bin has 1 over k probability. So if we had 12 bins for k equals 12, then each one would have a probability of 1 over 12, which equals 0 0.08 three, three, etc. Um, because we have 10 bins, pardon me, we can cross this out. That's not the one we're using. We're going to use pi equals 1 over 10 equals 0 0.10. That's saying that we want there to be a 10% chance that anything will fall in each bin. Okay, this is all to construct our bins. So now that we know the area in each bin, we can construct our bins. What does this look like? Let me see if this will, if I can just copy and paste this over here. Um, I guess I need to copy the lines too. Um, yeah, so what we're going to want to do is cut this up into pieces. I can just draw it. Here we go. We have a normal distribution that I've drawn here. And we want to cut it up. What you want is there to be a p of 0, 1 in each bin. So our first bin is going to be the one that has 0, 0.1 to the left. But then we're going to want another bin here that has 0, 0.1 in this little sliver, 0, 0.1 in this sliver, 0, 0.1 in this sliver, 0, 0.1 here. And then we'll do the same thing to the other side so that on each side we have five bins. If you had 12 bins, then you would want, you know, 
0.083 in each of these, um, and you'd have six on each side. If you had an odd number of bins, then, you know, have whatever. Yeah. In any case, you get the idea. We want to cut bins so that a z-score for each one has a certain probability of falling in there. So I hope this makes sense. Okay, so what this means is that we're going to want our first bin to be the one that has 10% in the lower tail, right? Now, how do we find this? Well, our z-score here is going to be... We can look it up. Let's get our z-table out. Uh, where's my z-table so I can show you guys how you do this? Mm. Sorry, I had it open and I closed it. There we go. Well, we want one that has 10% in the lower tail, um, which means it's going to have 40% in between 0 and z. So we find 0.4. Uh, it's going to be 1.28 right here, right? 1.28, except it's going to be negative. So right here, this first one is going to be negative 1.28. That's saying that there's a 10% chance we'll get a z-score lower than that. There's going to be a 10% chance that we're going to get a z-score in between uh, is negative 1.28 and whatever this one is. It turns out that that's uh, negative 0 0.84. And on our z table, we can we can look right. I'll show you this. Actually, I'll just show you my table here that I where I did this. So on the z table, you can see where we go from uh, from our bin widths to our z's. We have a percentile. The bottom 10% is going to have a z score that's less than negative 1.28. The next 10% is going to fall between negative 1.28 and negative 0.84. What we're doing now is we're creating bin walls, essentially, right? Um, we calculate all these z's, right? We find all these z's, and this diagram here shows you how we do that. And in doing that, we construct our bins for test scores by converting to our z, right? How does this work? Well, we, for one of them, let's look. So we can convert to our z score using our z-score formula. Under under the null, uh, under the null, we're going to have hmm, z equals x, where this x is just a test score, minus x bar over s, right? Because this is our mean under the null, that's mu zero, and this is our standard deviation under the null. Now we can multiply both sides by this, by s, to cancel out the s. There we go. Multiply over here. And then we subtract x bar, or we add x bar to each side. Cancels this out. And we have x equals x bar plus z times s. Okay, now that, so the chance of us getting a z score, 10% of these x's are going to fall below whatever this is with a z score of negative 1.28. Remember, x bar is fixed, s is fixed, and our bin walls are just these z's. So these are our bin walls for test scores. We're converting to test scores now. So we have these bins. We have 10 bins right here. We have 10 bins. Less than 55.1, between 55.1 and 59.68, between 59.68 and 63.01, uh, between 63.01 and 65.82, and those are the bins uh, for test scores. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. It's a little bit complicated. But once we've done that, we can generate our goodness of fit table. This is what it will look like. So what we've been doing is we've been generating intervals. This is how we generate intervals. So we use our theory to figure out where our bin should be. We use our z table to get values of z's. We use this formula here to convert uh, those to test scores for our uh, bin walls. And then we can create those intervals. Okay. Now, how do we do the rest of this stuff? Well, what we have is we have 50 individuals, right? We have 50 scores. Those are all the way at the top. And you can actually, I still have them in my Excel spreadsheet, so I should be able to just count them here. Now, if we sort our Excel spreadsheet, uh, we can just count. So this first interval, we can see how many people have scores of less than 55.1. Well, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. Now, how many people have scores between 55.1 and 59.68? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Again, 5. Next bin, we have 59.68 uh, and 63.01. Um, that's going to be all these, which is 9 of them. And the next one, 
you can just go through all the way down and you see that in each case uh, I have counted successfully to find uh, which you know how many we actually see in there now how many should we expect well because there's a 10% chance in falling in any of these bins by design that's how we designed them then for 50 people we should expect five to fall into each of these we calculate the rest of the test statistic working our way across just like we've done with other goodness of fit problems uh, we subtract uh, the expected frequency from the observed frequency we square it we divide by the expected frequency and then we add them up All right now if we add them up what do you get um, you're going to get a chi-squared you're going to get your test value of your test statistic which is going to be chi squared equals 7.2 so how many degrees of freedom does this have uh, under the null this is distributed with chi squared k minus 3 degrees of freedom k, k is 10 we have 10 bins so we have 7 degrees of freedom so I just delete this and put in 7 okay so we know that what does that say well, we have 7 degrees of freedom we want to figure out if we can reject the null 7.2 is our test statistic value we're looking in this uh, in this row and you can see that 7.2 falls in between 2.833 and 12.017 um, so what's our p-value well it's an upper tail test remember because it's always because uh, goodness of fit tests are always upper tail tests um, but our chi-squared value is going to fall in between our p-value 7.2 this area here is greater than 0 0.10 it's less than 0 0.90 but and that's our p-value but for any reasonable level of significance we're gonna fail to reject the null it looks like this data was pulled from uh, from a normal distribution or something that we, you know, we can't reject the null that is normally distributed so how do we do this well in this case the the null, the formulation of hypotheses is pretty easy the null is always, always that is normally distributed against the uh, alternative that it's not we need to calculate um, the sample mean and the sample standard deviation as point estimates of the population mean and the population standard deviation. Uh, this is the variance if you square it. Um, and then we need to generate the data to calculate this stuff. In order to do that, we need to generate bins. How many bins? Well, we divide their sample size by five and round down to ensure that we'll end up with five in there in each bin in expectation. We want equal size bins, so each bin has one over however many bins there are probability. And then we look on our table. Uh, to find that right so we chop the curve into those size probability slices and then we use that to get values of our z right we use this to get z's in, in principle you're going to want to get a bunch of different z's and then you use a formula like this to convert z's into scores um, on a test or whatever your data points right your data bins once you do that then you can count and you just count that's the easy part. So we have our intervals. We use our bin walls to create our intervals. Uh, we count how many show up in those intervals. Um, and then we, by, by uh, design, the expected frequency is always going to be 5-ish. Yeah, it's not always going to be the same. Um, it's going to be your sample size divided by k. right? Your expected frequency is always going to be n divided by k. Now, if it ends up even, then it's 5. If not, you might be 5.2 or 5.4 or something like that. But it's going to be somewhere in there. From there, you just go through the rest like a goodness of fit problem. Once you get here, this is actually a relatively easy goodness of fit problem. The other thing to remember is that it's uh, distributed with k minus 3 degrees of freedom. But the rest is just like every other goodness of fit problem we've done before. Anyway, test normality can be very useful. It can take a little while because you got to do some stuff with the data. Um, I hope that uh, that clears that up. I'll do a practice problem to show you guys in a little bit. Um, but for now, that's how you do it. And if you have any questions, send me an email at jjdelaney at ualr.edu or, uh, or leave a, a comment and I'll try to respond as soon as I can. Thanks. See you guys again soon. Bye.